Today's prelude to the worship is a setting of the hymn, This Is My Father's World. and welcome to Boise First United Methodist Church, the Cathedral of the Rockies. I'm Dr. Ian Sturrock, and I'm your Director of Music and Worship Arts. Wherever you are coming to us from the world today, we welcome you. Whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or even our church website, please consider liking or following our pages so that you can stay abreast of events here at the church. Today, Reverend Stacy Ballard will continue our comeback series with the Book of Esther, From Privilege to Inclusion. And now, Please join in our call to worship from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Amen.
Please join us in our opening prayer. My Lord, our King, you are our God. Please help us, for we are alone and have no one else to turn to. Do not forget us, O Lord. Be present to us in the time of our distress and grant us courage, O King of kings and ruler of every earthly power. Save us by your grace and come to our aid. We ask this in Christ's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, my name is Stacy Ballard, and I am your family life pastor here at Cathedral of the Rockies. It is my third week here with all of you, and our family has felt right at home. We have experienced God's goodness through all of the people, all of the faces that we've met, and I'm just so humbled and thankful to be bringing you the word this morning. Well, my daughter has this book that she was given on her first birthday. It's titled, She Persisted around the world, 13 Women Who Changed History. It's this incredible book that shares about all of these women who have this intense bravery that changed the future for so many generations to come. Um, highly, highly recommend it. You can find it at Target, at Barnes & Noble, at other bookstores. Um, they have other versions of the book that, with even more incredible history makers as well. But one of my favorite stories from this book is about a woman that you may have heard of. 
Civil war had erupted in Liberia when she had just finished high school. Living through the war inspired her to help other children affected by conflict. When civil war broke out again years later, she knew she didn't want to simply live through it this time or just help the victims afterward. She wanted to end it. She persisted, bringing thousands of Liberian Christian and Muslim women peacefully to protest the violence. Their efforts helped end the war and led to safe, free elections in which Liberia elected its first woman president. For her work, Lima Bowie was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. Now my daughter Canyon, our first daughter, she's currently three. And she may not understand the gravity of how these women changed history at this point in her life, but I want her to grow up hearing these stories. I want her to grow up hearing about the world-changing women whose shoulders she now stands on. And when our second daughter is born next month, she's due on August 18th, she too will get to grow up hearing these stories about these incredible women as the book is read to her at bedtime with her sister while they're snuggled up in bed with their pajamas. Stories are important. They remind us that brave people don't just happen. They remind us that world changers don't just happen. More often, it's the slow, steady willingness to ask the difficult questions and the willingness to continue showing up and leaning in even when it's difficult, brick by brick. So our story this morning gives us a glimpse into what the kingdom of God is like. It begins with a leader, with a king, a king who loves to party and he loves to show other people just how much wealth he has. He's been parading around his wealth and his power for six months and concluding that time with a seven day feast, a seven day party for his guests. There's unlimited wine served in the most beautiful cups made of gold. I mean, he's pulling out all the stops, right? And on this final day of this seven day party, he summons his wife to come to him and to showcase her beauty in front of all of his guests. He wants to show them just how beautiful his wife is. And, and furthermore, he doesn't, even ask, he doesn't even ask her directly to come before his guests. Instead, he summons servants to go and get her. So she's treated like a trophy wife, right? Like a possession. She's something to have to show off, which of course, she does not like, the queen does not like this, and she refuses to come when the king summons her. So then the king has a dilemma. What does he do? His wife has disobeyed him. She refused to do what he said. So the king asks his advisors what he should do. And the public opinion is to cast out the queen and to find the king a new queen. So that's what the king does they kick her out, which is where our lead story, our lead of the story comes into the picture now, right? Her beauty captures the attention and the heart of the king, a woman who has been orphaned and raised by her cousin for survival, whose true identity as a Jewish woman is kept concealed for fear of what would happen if people were to find out. Her name was Esther. Fast forward and the king continues to seek counsel from the people around him on what to do with his power. And, all, and the king gets convinced by a man named Haman to send out orders for the mass slaughter of all of the Jewish people in the land. You see, Haman has had this interaction with someone named Mordecai. And Mordecai was Esther's cousin right? The cousin that had raised her. So Mordecai refuses to bow down to Haman. And this bothers, this bothers Haman so greatly that his response is to petition the king to wipe out an entire group of people that Mordecai would just 
happen to be a part of, right? And in response, as a Jewish man, Esther's cousin grieves quite publicly and petitions for Esther to do something. Esther, who is the new queen, who is concealing her own identity as a Jewish woman in the palace for fear of what it might mean for her own survival. And here's Esther's response to her cousin Mordecai. Esther 4, 10 to 17 reads, In reply, Esther ordered Hathak, one of of her servants, to tell Mordecai, All the king's officials and all the people in his provinces know that there's a single law in a case like this. Any man or woman who comes to the king in the inner courtyard without being called is to be put to death. Only the person to whom the king holds out the gold scepter may live. In my case, I haven't even been called to come to the king for the past 30 days. When they told Mordecai Esther's words, he had them respond to Esther. Don't think for one minute that unlike all the other Jews, you'll come out of this alive simply because you are in the palace. In fact, if you don't speak up at this very important time, relief and rescue will appear for the Jews from another place, but you and your family will die. But who knows? Maybe it was for a moment just like this that you came to be part of the royal family. Esther sent back this word to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and tell them to give up eating to help me be brave. They aren't to eat or drink for three whole days, and I myself will do the same, along with my female servants. Then, even though it's against the law, I will go to the king, and if I am to die, then I will die. So Mordecai left where he was and did exactly what Esther had ordered him. Esther has found herself in a position of great influence, and yet it's not complete authority, right? She knows that her current position could easily be taken away. She knows that her life could easily be taken away. And the king is quite dangerous. He's someone in a position of power who does not take human life seriously. As we read about the empire in place, we see a picture painted of a society where the vulnerable do not fare well. Even the most trivial kinds of conflicts, the most trivial kinds of things can have massively detrimental consequences. When the king gets upset that his wife won't come to him, he just throws her out and marries someone else, right? When his advisor, Haman, feels offended that someone won't bow down to him, he easily convinces the king to commit mass genocide. We see an empire where a king can't make decisions for himself, and he repeatedly overreacts. It's a bit of a novella where it's easy for us to shake our heads at it, right? Where it's easy to shake our heads at the leadership that's in place. The king's use of power makes him quite dangerous, particularly to those who are more vulnerable. And in this case, the Jewish people are more vulnerable. And what's interesting up until this point of the story, right, is that we haven't heard anything about Esther trying to leverage her position to gain power for herself or to secure her station or her position at court. We haven't heard anything about her trying to produce a male heir to the throne, which was one of the fastest ways to secure your place at court. You could say it kind of seems like Esther is trying to keep a low profile. So when her cousin petitions her to do something about this impending genocide, we aren't too surprised by Esther's response, right? To know that approaching the king when you have not been summoned could mean your death, that is a very scary thing. And yet Mordecai responds, telling her that if she doesn't speak up, someone else will. And then he says one of his most famous lines, one of the most famous scriptures from the book of Esther. He says, maybe it was for a moment like this 
that you came to be a part of the royal family. <laughs> I, can't help but, um, I can't help but read that scripture and think about uh, that Kelly Clarkson song from American Idol, if you, if you remember a moment like this. I think Kelly Clarkson was from the early 2000s or, or something like that. I lost count after like the 20th American Idol. I don't know if they're still going. So if you know if it's still going, come connect with me and I would love to hear about how many seasons in they are now. But anyway, and then, so spoiler alert, moving back to our story, right? Away from Kelly Clarkson. Spoiler alert, if you have not read the book of Esther, she puts on her big girl pants here and goes to influence the king and saves her people from death. Esther's story is one that we can relate to in so many ways. It's easy to see the similarities and characteristics of people we might know or maybe in the leadership that we've seen. Leaders who do not take human life seriously. Leaders who make decisions with poor counsel that have detrimental consequences but also relatability in holding our own positions of power and authority and choosing to fly below the radar. When we read this text, we can't help but think about who the most vulnerable are among us. In our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our workplace. We can't read this text without thinking about our own positions of power and authority that we carry. As a woman, I know that I am and have at times been in places of vulnerability in the workplace. And yet my skin color also gives me a great deal of privilege and power that has been built into the fabric of our society. We can't read this text without thinking about our brothers and sisters of color and the broken systems that have continued to treat them as less than and silenced their voices. It takes great strength to speak truth to power. Esther had a lot of reasons to stay silent, her life hanging in the balance for one. And there are lots of reasons that we too choose to stay silent. Sometimes we choose to stay silent because of messages, whether intentionally or not, that have been taught to us since we were little, since we were very, very young, right? Um, Sometimes it's the cultural constructs around us that tell us it's better to stay silent. Oftentimes, we can talk ourselves out of it because we think of all the great things someone has done and, and it almost feels like an act of betrayal, right? To call out abuses of power, right? We're like, oh no, we, we make up all these excuses for someone and we say, oh, but they're X, Y, and Z, so we can't call out this right here right? But maybe that one hits home with you especially. And I want to tell you today that it's not an act of betrayal to speak up. It's an act of justice. And love looks like justice. Love looks like Jesus. And lastly, maybe a reason that it's hard to speak up is because your paycheck depends on feeding your children. So that fear of being able to provide if things, go, if things go wrong holds you back. All of these things feel so real to us. We long for justice, but the weight it carries is heavy, isn't it? Tiffany Bloom, an author and speaker, says this, to seek justice is holy and good and right, and we cannot deconstruct broken systems until we are willing to seek justice. Silence will likely cost nothing, but speaking up could cost everything. Mordecai brought to light for Esther the privilege she did have and the influence she held. He asked her to show up in this moment, refusing to be a bystander Esther used the power that had been afforded to her by putting her neck on the line so that others might live. That's the gospel, right? Esther chooses the path of life, unwilling to save her own skin and to let her people die. She came from nothing and found herself settling into the palace. 
And yet that wasn't the true ending to her comeback story, was it? Right? It's not the rags to riches story that makes Esther's story truly great. It's what she does with the influence that she's been given. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that one more time for you, okay? I'm going to say that one more time. It's not the rags to riches that makes Esther's story truly great. It's what she does with the influence that's been given to her. What do we do with the power that's been given to us? Are we using it to help the more vulnerable among us? Do we see the power and resources that have been given to us as something to give away for the sake of others? I think that sometimes when we're wrestling with these questions, the loudest question in our minds can become, where do I even begin? Where do I even begin? Maybe a good place to start is to ask yourself, what conversations can you be a part of for policy change that care for the more vulnerable among us? And what connections and circles are you a part of that have influence for positive change? What conversations might God be calling you to be the one to start? Or maybe God is putting it on your heart that you just need to show up that in this moment, you simply need to show up for the people around you with the gifts and talents you have been given, recognizing that you have love to give. On August 18th, we're having a volunteer fair here at the church, and we're inviting you to commit to 90 days of service in the life of the church to make a difference in our community. Children's Ministries will be relaunching Sunday School next month. Maybe you could be a greeter or a teacher in one of those classes. When we serve those around us and choose life, we get glimpses of the kingdom of God as we were created to be. I think of Lima Bowie's quote again, the more I did, the more I could do. The more I wanted to do, the more I saw needed to be done. Brick by brick, courage is built. Comeback stories come in all shapes and sizes. Maybe one of the biggest takeaways we can receive from Esther's story is that a good comeback story is not about the sole prosperity of one person, but rather for all people. To have courage to walk the path of life as Esther did, as God calls all of us to. What we are given is meant to be given away. So what if our comeback stories aren't really meant for us, but rather someone else who's still waiting on theirs? Mm. That'll preach. If you're prepared to give today, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do so. You can find a link on our church website to either give a one-time gift or set up a reoccurring gift. Because of you and your generosity, ministry and life happens here and through our community. So thank you, thank you for the ways that you are contributing to the work of the kingdom.
Would you receive this prayer as your benediction? God of justice, you sent your servant Esther into a life of privilege so that those without would be taken care of. In our privilege, show us how to advocate for those who have less so that your world might be peaceful and just. In your holy name, we pray these things. Amen. Peace be with you, friends.